In today's lecture, we're going to cover actor-critic algorithms. Actor-critic algorithms build on the policy grading framework that we discussed in the previous lecture, but they're also augmented with learned value functions and Q functions. So to begin, let's recap the policy gradients material from last time. Last time we learned about the reinforce algorithm, which alternates between three steps. It samples a batch of trajectories by running the current policy in the environment. So you sample n trajectories in this way. And then we use these trajectories to compute an estimate of the policy gradient, uh, which is calculated by averaging over all of our samples, a sum over all time steps of grad log pi at that time step times the sum of rewards from that step until the end, or the reward to go. And then we take this approximate policy gradient and we add it multiplied by some learning rate to our current parameter vector, which corresponds to a gradient ascent optimization process. The, this algorithm follows the basic anatomy of the reinforcement learning algorithm that we discussed before, where the orange box corresponds to generating the samples, the green box corresponds to calculating the reward to go at every time step for every sample, and the blue box corresponds to applying the gradient ascent rule. Now, in the lecture last time, I somewhat suggestively used the, the symbol Q hat to denote the reward to go. And this choice was deliberate because when you uh, exploit uh, this causality property that I described, it turns out that the way that you should calculate your policy gradient is by multiplying each grad log pi by the total reward that you expect to get if you start in state SIT, then take action AIT, and then follow your policy. That's a very reasonable interpretation of the policy gradient. You're essentially saying that you will increase the probability of those actions that in, in expectation lead to high rewards and decrease the probabilities of those actions that in, in expectation lead to low rewards. But let's examine this Q hat term a little bit more closely. Q hat represents an estimate of the expected reward if you take action AIT in state SIT and then follow your policy until the end of the trajectory. But can we get a better estimate of this quantity? Let's imagine that this curvy line represents one of the trajectories that you sampled. And your um, uh, Q hat is calculated at a particular time step. So this green circle represents the state SIT, so the ith sample time step t, and at that point in time, we're going to calculate an estimate of our reward to go q hat. And then we're going to multiply our grad log pi by that reward to go. So the way that we calculate this estimate is by summing up the rewards that we actually got along that trajectory. But that trajectory represents just one of the many possibilities. So if we were to somehow accidentally land in the same exact state again, and then run our policy just like we did on this rollout, we might get a different outcome simply because the policy and the MDP have some randomness in them. So right now we're using a single step estimate for the reward to go, but in reality there are many possibilities for what might happen next. So we would have a better estimate of the reward to go if we could actually compute a full expectation over all these different possibilities. The reason that there are many possibilities is simply because there's randomness in the system. Our policy has randomness and our MDP has randomness. But this randomness can be quite significant, which means that our single sample estimate that we got by summing up the rewards that we actually obtained in that trajectory might be quite far off from the actual expected value. Now, this problem I'm going to claim directly relates to the high variance of the policy gradient. And I'd like all of you to take a moment to think about what this has to do with variance. So the connection to variance is that the policy gradient way of calculating the reward to go is a single sample estimate of a very uh, complex expectation. The fewer samples you use to estimate an expectation, the higher the variance of your estimator will be. So a single sample estimator has very high variance. If we could somehow generate a million samples starting from the same state action tuple, then we would have much lower variance. If we could somehow calculate this expectation exactly, we would have much, much lower variance. So if we had access to the true expected reward to go, 
defined as the true expected value of the sum of rewards that we get starting from state SIT and action AIT, then the variance of our policy grading will be much lower. And then if we had this uh, Q function, we could simply plug it in in place of Q hat and get a lower variance policy gradient. Now, in the previous lecture, we also learned about this thing called baselines, which could lower the variance of a policy gradient even further. Can we apply a baseline even when we have the true Q function? And the answer is that, of course, we can. So we can subtract some quantity B. Uh, we learned last time that the average reward was a good choice for B, although not the optimal choice. So what do we average? Well, we could average Q values. So we could say, well, let's make B just be the average Q value at that time step over all the states and actions that we saw. And then we will have this appealing property that the policy gradient will increase the probability of actions that are better than average in terms of their reward to go expectation and decrease the probability of actions that are worse than average. But it turns out that we can lower the variance even further because the baseline can actually depend on the state. It can't depend on the action that leads to bias, but you can make it depend on the state. So uh, if you make the baseline depend on the state, then the best thing to do, or not, not the optimal thing to do, but a, a better thing to do, would be to compute the average reward over all the possibilities that start in that state. So not just the average reward over all possibilities at that time step, but specifically in that specific state. And if you average your Q values over all the actions in a particular state, that's simply the definition of the value function. So a very good choice for the baseline is the value function. So you can uh, calculate your policy gradient as grad log pi multiplied by QSIT AIT minus VSIT. This is in fact a very intuitive quantity because the difference between the Q value and the value function represents your uh, estimate of how much better the action AIT is on average than the average action you would take in the state SIT. So it makes a lot of sense to multiply your grad log pi terms by this because it's directly saying take the actions that are better than average in that state and increase their probability and take the actions that are worse than average in that state and decrease their probability. In fact, this Q minus V term is so important that we have a special name for it. We call it the advantage function. The reason we call it the advantage function is that it represents how advantageous the action AIT is as compared to the average performance that you would expect the policy pi theta to get in the state SIT. Okay, so uh, let's talk about state and state action value functions. By the way, when I say state action value function or Q function, those mean exactly the same thing but sometimes saying state action value function uh, can be a little clearer. So our Q function, or state action value function, represents the total expected reward that you expect to get if you start in state ST, take action AT, and then follow your policy. We will often write the Q function with the superscript pi to emphasize that the Q function depends on pi, so every policy will have a different Q function. The value function is the expected value over all the actions in state ST under your current policy uh, of the Q value. Another way of saying it is it's, it's the total reward that you expect to get if you start in state ST and then follow your policy. The advantage function is the difference between these two quantities. And the advantage function represents how much better the action AT is as compared to the average performance of your policy pi in state ST. So we can get a very good estimate of the policy gradient if we simply multiply the grad log pi terms by the advantage value uh, at SIT AIT. Now, of course, in reality, we won't have the correct value uh, of the advantage. We'll have to estimate it, for example, using some function approximator. So the better our estimate of the advantage, the lower our variance will be. Now, it's also worth mentioning uh, that the kind of actor critic methods that we'll discuss in today's lecture don't necessarily produce unbiased estimates of the advantage function. So while the policy grading we've discussed so far has been unbiased, if your advantage function is incorrect, then your entire policy grading can also be biased. 
Usually we're okay with that because the enormous reduction in variance is often worth the slight increase in bias that we incur from using approximate Q values and value functions. So to summarize, the conventional policy gradient uses a kind of a Monte Carlo estimate of the advantage calculated by using the one sample that you have in the remainder of the current trajectory by summing up the rewards in your trajectory and subtracting a baseline. This is an unbiased but high variance single sample estimate and we can replace it with an approximate advantage function which itself is usually calculated from an approximate Q function or an approximate value function and get a much lower variance estimate because now uh, we're potentially getting a better estimate for this expectation that does not rely on a single sample but often the resulting approximate value functions will have some bias so we'll trade off lots of variance for some small increase in bias. So the structure of the resulting algorithms will now have a much more elaborate green box. So the orange box will be the same as before. We'll generate samples by running our policy. The blue box will still be the same. We'll still use the policy gradient to do gradient descent. But the green box will now involve fitting some kind of estimator, either an estimator to Q pi or an estimator to V pi or, or A pi. So let's talk about that uh, next. Let's talk about fitting value functions. So we have three possible quantities. Uh, Q, V, or A. Ultimately, we want A, but the question we might ask is, well, what should we fit? Which of these three should we fit, and what should we fit it to? What should our uh, targets be? So should we fit Q, V, or A? Take a moment to think about this choice and consider some of the pros and cons of one choice or another. So the Q function is the expected value of the reward that we will get when we start from state st, take action at, and then follow our policy. Now, one very convenient property of this is that because st and at are not actually random variables, we can rewrite the q function as simply the current reward plus the expected value of the reward in the future, because the current reward depends on st and at, and they are not random, so this, this equality is exact. And this uh, quantity uh, that we're adding is simply the expected value of the value function at the state st plus 1 that we will get when we take action at in state st. So uh, we can similarly write the q function in terms of the value function as the current reward plus the expected value of the, reward, of the, val of the value function at the next time step. And the expectation here is, of course, taken with respect to the transition dynamics. Now we can make a small approximation where we could say that the actual state st plus 1 that we saw in the current trajectory is kind of representative of the average st plus 1 that we'll get. Now at this point we've made an approximation. This is, this is not an exact equality. We're essentially approximating the distribution over states at the next time step with, again, a single sample estimator. But now it's a single sample estimator for just that one time step. Everything after that is still integrated out as represented by the value function v pi. So we've made this approximation, and now we might wonder, well, OK, uh, so we lost a little bit. We still have lower variance, but not quite as low as we had before. Why would we want to do that? Well, the reason that we would want to do that is because if we then substitute this approximate equation for the q value into the equation for the advantage, we get this very appealing expression where the advantage is now approximately equal to the current reward plus the next value minus the current value. This is still an approximation because to be exact, this v pi st plus 1 needs to be in expectation over all possible values of st plus 1, whereas we've just substituted the actual st plus 1 that we saw. But what's very appealing about this equation is that now it depends entirely on v. And v is more convenient to learn than q or a because q and a both depend on the state and the action, whereas v depends only on the state. When your function approximator depends on fewer things, uh, it's easier to learn because uh, you won't need as many samples. So maybe what we should do is just fit v pi of s. This is not the only choice for actor critic algorithms, and we will learn about actor critic methods that use uh, q functions as well later on in the course, but for now, we'll talk about actor critic algorithms that just fit v pi of s and then use this equation 
uh, to derive the advantage function approximately. So when we fit v pi of s, we would have some kind of model, such as a neural network, that maps states s to approximate values v hat pi of s. And this network will have some parameters, which I'm going to call phi. So let's talk about the process of fitting v pi of s. Uh, this process is sometimes referred to as policy evaluation, because v pi represents the value of the policy at every state, so calculating the value is evaluation. In fact, if you think back to the le lecture uh, last week on the definitions of reinforcement learning problems, you will remember that the reinforcement learning objective itself can be expressed as the expected value of the value function over the initial state distribution. So if you compute the value function, you can literally evaluate how good your policy is just by averaging together the values at the initial states. So that's the expression here. Our objective j theta can be expressed as just the expected value of v pi at the initial states. So how can we perform policy evaluation? Well, one thing that we could do is we could use Monte Carlo policy evaluation. In a sense, this is what policy gradients do. In Monte Carlo policy evaluation, we earn our policy many, many times, and then sum together the rewards obtained along the trajectories generated by the policy and use that as an unbiased but high variance estimate of the policy's total reward. So we could say that the value at state st is approximately the sum over all the rewards that we saw after visiting state t along the trajectory that visited state st. So here is our rollout, here is the state st, and we're just going to sum all of this, the things that we saw after that along that one trajectory. Now ideally, what we would like to be able to do is sum over all possible trajectories uh, that could occur when you start from that state, because there's more than one possibility. So we would like to sum over all of these things. Unfortunately, in the model free setting, this is generally impossible because this requires us to be able to reset back to the state ST and run multiple trials starting from that state. Generally, we don't assume that we're able to do this. We only assume that we're able to run multiple trials from the initial state. So typically we can't do this, but if you have access to a simulator that you can reset, you can technically calculate your Monte Carlo uh, values in this way. Okay, so what happens if we use a neural network function approximator for the value function with this kind of Monte Carlo evaluation scheme? Well, we have our neural network, v hat pi with parameters phi. We, we're going to, at every state that we visit, sum together the remaining rewards, and that will produce our target values. But then, instead of plugging those uh, reward to goes directly into our policy gradient, we'll actually fit a neural network to those values. And that will actually reduce our variance, because even though we can't visit the same state twice, our function approximator, our neural network, will actually realize that different states that we visited in different trajectories are similar to one another. So even though this uh, green state along the first trajectory will never be visited more than once in continuous state spaces, if we have another trajectory rollout that is kind of nearby, but then where something else happened later down the line in that trajectory, the function approximator will realize that these two states are similar, and when it uh, tries to estimate the value at both of these states, the value of one will sort of leak into the value of the other. That's the, essentially generalization. Generalization means that uh, your function approximator understands that nearby states should take on similar values. So if, if you accidentally had a very different outcome in one of those states than you did in the other, the function approximator will to some degree average those out and produce lower variance estimates than you would have gotten if you had just directly used that single sample value in your policy gradient. So it's not as good as making multiple rollouts from the same state, but it's still pretty good. So the way that we would do this is we would generate training data by taking all of our rollouts, and for each state along every rollout, we create a tuple consisting of the state SIT and a label corresponding to the sum of rewards that we saw starting from SIT for the rest of that rollout. And we're going to call these uh, uh, labels yit. And I'm, when I say target value, I mean yit. So we'll get these tuples sit, yit, 
And then we'll solve a supervised regression problem. We'll train our neural network value function so that its parameters phi minimize the sum over all of our samples of the squared error between the value function's prediction and the single sample Monte Carlo estimate of the value at that state. Of course, if our function approximator massively overfits and produces exactly uh, the training label at every single state, then we wouldn't have gained much as compared to just directly using uh, the yit values in our policy gradient. But if we get generalization, meaning that our function approximator understands that two nearby states should have similar values, even if their labels are different, then we'll actually get lower variance uh, because this function approximator will now average out the dissimilar labels at similar states. But can we do even better? Uh, so the ideal target that we would like to have when training our value function is the true expected value of rewards starting from the state SIT. Of course, we don't know this quantity. The Monte Carlo target that we used before uses a single sample estimate of this quantity. But uh, we can also use the relationship uh, that we wrote out before, uh, where we saw that a Q function is simply equal to the reward at the current time step plus the expected reward uh, at starting from the next time step. And if we write out this quantity, then we can perform the same substitution as before and actually replace the second term in the summation with our estimate of the value function. And this is a better lower variance estimate of the reward to go than our single sample estimator. So this says, let's use the actual reward that we saw at the current time step plus the value at the actual state that we saw at the next time step. Now, of course, we don't know the value v pi, so we're going to approximate that simply by using our previous function approximator. So we'll assume that our previous v hat pi phi was kind of okay, like maybe it wasn't great, but it's probably better than nothing. So we can plug it in in place of v pi and get what is called a bootstrapped estimator. So here we're directly going to use the previous fitted value function to estimate this quantity. So now our training data will consist of tuples of the states that we saw SIT and labels that correspond to the reward that we actually got at that time step, RSIT AIT, plus the estimate of the value function at the actual next state SIT plus one that we saw. Now this estimate v hat might be incorrect, but as we repeat this process, hopefully these values will get closer and closer to the correct values. And because the v hats are averaging together all possible future uh, returns, we expect their variance to be lower. So now our target value yit is given by the sum and our training process, just like before, is going to be supervised regression onto these yits. This is sometimes referred to as a bootstrap estimate. And the bootstrap estimate has lower variance because it's using v hat instead of a single sample estimator, but it also has higher bias because our v hat pi phi might be incorrect. So that's the trade-off. All right, so to conclude this portion of the lecture, what I want to do is give you a few examples of policy evaluation, just so that you get a better intuitive understanding of what the heck policy evaluation actually means. Uh, because in many cases, policy evaluation actually is a very intuitive concept. For example, if we're training a reinforced learning system with actor critic to play backgammon, this is from the TD Gammon paper in 1992, maybe our reward corresponds to the outcome of the game. It's one if you win the game and zero if you don't. Then our value function is simply the expected outcome given the board state. If you get a one if you win the game and zero if you lose, then the value function just directly predicts the probability that you'll win the game given the state of the board right now. Very intuitive. Similarly, if you're training a system to play Go and your reward is the game outcome, exactly the same thing. Your value function is actually trying to predict how likely are you to win the game given the state of the board right now. Now this is very convenient for board games because we know the rules that govern these board games. So we can simulate what would happen if we make a move. In fact, we can simulate every possible move, check its value, and then take the move that leads to the highest value state. This is much cheaper than doing a full game tree because all you have to do is predict one step into the future, 
and then your value function tells you, given what will happen after that one step, how much, uh, you know, how likely are you to win the game? And then you take the move that most increases your probability to win the game. So policy evaluation can have very natural interpretations. In the next portion of the lecture, we'll talk about how we can use policy evaluation in a complete actor-critic algorithm uh, to uh, derive a new reinforcement learning method.